morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Mount Vernon Presbyterian Church. Do we have any folks worshiping with us for the first time this Sunday morning? Any first time here today? Okay, I won't go into this field about how friendly we are and how open and inviting we are. Hopefully, you all know that. Take a moment now, turn around, and greet one another with the peace and the joy of Jesus Christ. Contemplation. And 
the need for just quiet moments and opportunities to truly hear from God. So I invite you to just take a deep breath this morning, to breathe in the beauty of God's creation and exhale all those things that are not of God together. Let us come and worship.
Lead us in the way of Jesus and prepare us to share the joy of our faith with anyone who asks. God, your heart breaks through the violence and cruelty that abounds. Gather those who suffer under your wings as a hen shelters her chicks and bring healing to their spirits and wounds. Now quiet all the distractions and make ready our hearts hear your words for us today. In the name of Jesus, amen. Our reading this morning is something which you can find in the Pew Bible on page 427. This is a hymn of praise that echoes the creation story in Genesis. And you will notice that it begins and ends with the same words. So listen for the word of God. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes, to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them? Mortals that you care for them. Yet you have made them a little more than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet. All sheep and under and also the beasts birds of the air, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the world. The word of the Lord.
so, um, how many of you remember what we talked about last week? Cain and Abel, right. Did you guys, did any of you have any good conversations with your mom or dad or whoever brought you about that? You read the book? Good. I, I, I heard that some of you had some pretty good conversations about that. Today, do you know what book of the Bible the story of Cain and Abel is in? It's in the Old Testament. Which book? The very first one. Genesis, right? We're going to stay in Genesis this morning. And I'm going to tell you another story. This one involves a boat. No, not Jesus in this morning. Noah's Ark. Right, Noah's Ark. You know the story of Noah's Ark, right? Okay. You read it? Yeah. How many of you guys um, have seen the advertisements on TV for a new movie coming out called... Maleficent. You saw it already. You saw the trailer? It's, it, it looks like it's going to be a little different from the Disney movie about. Is that from Sleeping Beauty? The Evil Witch. Right? What's, you know what's interesting to me is they're going to tell the same story, but they're going to tell it really differently. Yeah. yeah good, good, good stories are told differently. And this, it's true not just of Disney stories, but it's true of Bible stories. It's true of Bible stories as well. There are different ways to tell them. Now, in the, very, in the story of Noah's Ark that you probably... Most of you have probably heard before. Why does it rain for 40 days? Okay, because the people because people were doing bad things, they forgot about God. And so what did in the traditional telling of the story, what did God do? Ian, do you know what God did? Because of all the bad things that people were doing in the Noah's Ark story? Let me just say this. 
God doesn't get so angry that he would kill us. God would never, ever do anything like that. And the promise of that in the story is what? In the story, it's, the promise is a rainbow. You love rainbows. Well, whenever you see a rainbow, it should be a reminder. Do you like rainbows? It should be a reminder that God loves us. Okay. Talk with your parents about that on the way home. Okay? Will you do that? Let's, let's pray, and then you guys can go back to your seats. God, uh, even for these little ones, try to make sense of uh, this time we've had together this morning. Speak to them and teach them. In Jesus' name, we pray.
it might be interpreted always against the measure of your love for us. Move and speak. For the sake of Jesus, in whose name we pray. I invite you to listen now to this very familiar passage from Genesis chapter 6. When people began to multiply on the face of the ground, and the daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that they were fair, and they took wives for themselves of all they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in mortals forever, for they are flesh. Their days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward. When the sons of God went into the daughters of humans, who bore children to them, these were the heroes that were of old, warriors of renown. The law, the Lord, saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out from the earth the human beings I have created, people together, with animals and creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But, no, no, found faith in the sight of the Lord. Friends, this is the word of the Lord and the poetry of the faith that he speaks to God. Well, as I shared last week, Shannon and I were in D.C. two Saturdays ago for Yoga on the Mall. And as wonderful as that morning was, there was a shadow of sadness on that hill beside Constitution Gardens. A shadow of sadness because I just can never seem to turn off my pastor's heart. And I definitely can never keep my mind from thinking and processing and analyzing all that I always see going on around me. Drives my life crazy. So while we were certainly uh, not the oldest ones down there, we were definitely in the upper age brackets. By far, most of the people there were between probably 25 and 40. Easily over a thousand of them. Born sometime between the early 80s and the early 90s, along with several hundred more Gen Xers, born in the, in the mid to late 70s. So as I looked around, when I was supposed to be standing there in triangle pose, looking and noticing this vast sea of young faces, I couldn't help wonder what on earth drew them there. It was 10.30 on a Saturday morning, and hundreds, literally hundreds of people were out on the mall for one of the most popular spiritual practices of our day, yoga. The very people who wouldn't be caught dead in a church at 10.30 on a Sunday morning were out on the mall doing yoga. Why? Other than the fact we were outside, which no doubt was a draw, what made that Saturday morning experience any more significant than a Sunday morning experience in a church like Mount Vernon? As I stood there trying to take it all in, I wondered what I could learn from these people. What could they tell us about what we need to be doing in order to get them here on a Sunday morning. And, and please 
tell, and I want to make this clear right at the outset. I say that not because, because I want to be some kind of pastor of a brand new mega church on Sherwood Hallway. I say that not because I'm, I'm just interested in getting people in our pews or growing our budgets. I've been in ministry long enough to give up on all of those kinds of crazy, unrealistic goals. I ask this question, how do we get people here? Because that's what it means for us to be faithful to our call. And not just me, but every one of us. Our responsibility is to share our faith with those around us. To help people discover the great adventure of following Jesus. I've used that phrase for almost 20 years now, and I'm not sure I'll ever be able to get away from it. For me, faith is about nothing more and nothing less than this great adventure of learning to follow Jesus and what that means. That's what I want to share with others, with as many people as I can. And I think that is the job of the church, sharing this adventure with as many people as possible. So what do we need to do in order to get these people, this lost generation, as they're being referred to by some, what do we need to do to get them to darken our doors on Sunday morning? I don't know how to answer that question. I'm not sure there is an answer to that question. At least not a blanket answer for every church that every community of faith needs to be following. I certainly don't think that after a mere 11 months here that I have the specific answers for this congregation. But what I can say, the thing that I have been saying since I arrived last summer, while I don't know what needs to change, I do know that the church, capital C, needs to change. The height of absurdity, we all know, is doing the same thing the same way and expecting different results. So my job here is to work with our session to determine exactly what the changes are going to look like. And as I indicated last week, like Diana Butler Bass, whose book Christianity After Religion is the basis for this sermon series, I don't think we need to do away with religion. We just need better religion. We need better practices to help us live out this, this adventure we call faith in ways that make it more contagious to the world that is around us. That's where the church appears to have fallen down on the job. Author and, author and Pastor Brian McLaren has been saying it for a long time. He contends that the church must change in order for it to survive. And the changes, hear this, the changes are so much more than, than a pastor just taking off his or her robe or singing to guitars as opposed to an organ. There's so much more than changing what you do in coffee hour, serving better coffee, putting up screens in your worship place. That is not at the heart of the change that needs to take place in the church. Those things are important, don't get me wrong, but they are certainly not ends in and of themselves. The evolving church, as Glenn refers to it in his adult discipleship class, is about so much more. It's not just about new answers to old questions. It's about different questions. That's how drastic and significant the change needs to be. Most people today, let me give you an example. Most people today, I would contend most of the people that were down the hall last Saturday, they're not interested in debating that classic church question, will only Christians go to heaven when we die? Or will all people, will people of other faiths find their way there as well? Today, that's just not a question that this lost generation is asking. That's not even a question someone like me is asking. Rather, 
The kind of question that I, and I think all of those other people out there are asking, is how does the world experience heaven on earth here, now? How do we care for our planet? How do we care for one another? How do we make life as God intended it to be lived? This is the kind of morphing that the church needs to consider. Are you familiar with that word? Morphing? Remember the Power Rangers? When my boys were little, that was their favorite television show. That's where I remember first hearing the word morph. It's actually a word used when talking about special effects in motion pictures and in animations. Corey, you probably know all about that word. I think it was actually first used in Michael Jackson's video, Black and White. Do you remember that? He's got all of these faces that come on the screen and they just, some of you are looking like, what on earth are they talking about? Some of you remember the video, the music? Okay, good. The faces just kind of, all these different kinds of faces, black, white, Asian, and they just kind of fade in and out, male, female. It's kind of, that's what morphing is all about. It's this seamless transition and change. It's what the mighty Morphin Power Rangers did. If you're not familiar, they were teenagers who were chosen to protect the world from alien, alien invaders by morphing at the appropriate time into these, well, Power Rangers who could take care of everyone in need. They were superheroes, and they would change. They would change when they needed to in order to do what was ever needed to help those who were struggling. They changed when they needed to in order to help those who needed them. That is what the church is all about. It's where the body of Christ is today. It's time for us to morph, to change, and to do whatever we need to do in order to help a world that is in desperate need of knowing the grace and the peace and the love of our God. I bet my life that that is one of the people who were on the mall last weekend doing downward dog and come. They may not be interested in going to church, but they're interested in love. They're interested in peace. They're interested in caring for all that is around them. They're interested in accepting people where they are, embracing them, caring for them. In so many ways, Jen and I have left. They seem like they're the 21st century hippies. That's, that's where I think they are. They're searching for something. Not just rejecting what they've been given. Hear that. They're searching for something more. Not just rejecting what they've been given. They're longing for what might be. Not just rebelling against what is. It would be easy for us to look at them and see only the latter parts of those sentences. But they truly are, I think, people searching for more. Longing for more. They are looking for an experience with God. And that is where we sometimes fail as the body of Christ. Author and Harvard professor Harvey Cox, in his book, The Future of Faith, writes about the changes that have been taking place in the church over history. And like Phyllis Tickle, whose book some of us have read recently, Cox says that the history of Christianity can be divided into some three different eras, and we see different things taking place in those eras. In the first era, he, he calls it the age of belief. The first 500 years of Christianity, that's when faith was understood as a way of life that was based on faith, trust in something more, Jesus. To be a Christian meant to follow in the way of Jesus. 
to follow the model that he set for us. But then came the Protestant Reformation, and the church moved from the age of faith into what he calls the age of belief. Cox says that the church's faith thickened into catechisms, replacing faith in Jesus with tenets about Jesus. Think about that. He writes from an energetic movement of people seeking to live in the footsteps of Jesus, Christianity coagulated into a mere set of propositional beliefs. And Cox, Cox contends that that stage lasted for about 500 years. Somewhere in our generation, the church began moving yet again. This time into what he calls the age of the spirit. And that's where we find ourselves today. In this age, people like my yoga friends down in the mall find themselves looking for an experience. They're non-dogmatic, non-institutional, non-hierarchical, and they are longing to connect with God, as well as all of the mystery that comes with God. They're eager to engage artistic expressions of holiness and to participate in justice work that truly does seek to make the world a better place. They're quick. They're quick to see God all around them in the beauty of creation and the diversity of people from various backgrounds in the richness of different cultures and traditions and lifestyles. They're open. They're inclusive. They're quick to see the image of God in all people, and they're aware of nuggets of truth found everywhere. Now, remarkably, I would say beautifully, all of this fits with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So why has it been so hard for the church to embrace these people, to connect with these people? What is the problem? Well, this morning, my contention is that it's for one simple reason. We are bound by a theology that places too much emphasis on a very distorted and unbiblical understanding of sinfulness and too little emphasis on the reality of God's perfect love and amazing grace. And this is where Genesis 6 comes into play. How, anybody here seen Russell Crowe's version of Noah? Did you see it last night? Um, if you have not seen it, it's worth going to. Um, it's even good for kids. It's a little dark. I mean, they've seen Maleficent, though. I don't think it's any darker than that movie looks uh, in the trailers. It's still playing in Kingstown and in AMC down on Swamp Fox Road. Um, it will be out on DVD in late July. See it. And if you want to go have coffee and talk about it afterwards, I would love to do that. It's, it raises all kinds of questions about this story that we all think we know. Whether raised in the church or not, the story of Noah and his ark is a story that everyone, or at least almost everyone, has heard. Animals on an ark, with a rainbow in the heavens, and a dove flying through the sky with an olive branch in its mouth. Those scenes grace the walls of countless nurseries in churches all over the world. But think of the story. Think of the story. Listen again to the three of the verses I read this morning. The Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth 
and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on earth. So the Lord said, I will blot out from the earth the human beings I have created, people together with animals and creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry I have made them. Friends, like the verse last week about Cain going away from the presence of the Lord, a verse that we know is just not accurate. This passage must be read in similar light. It must be read alongside of so many other passages in the Bible. And when it is seen alongside of Scripture as a whole, Scripture as a whole, the entire message of the Bible, the church must be strong and bold in declaring that the passage simply does not present an accurate picture of God. At least not a picture of God that we can embrace in its entirety. Because if we do that, we wind up driving people away from God. If we don't unteach these kinds of messages, if we don't correct the loudest voices in Christendom today and give voice to what I believe to be the majority view, the way most of us read and understand this story, then we are going to continue to lose an entire generation of people. And the church's future will remain in peril. If there's one message driving people away from the church today, it is the message that God is angry with us. And that, that kind of reading of Scripture destroys the possibility of many people believing. Contrary to what many of us have been taught, and count, contrary to what so many are saying today, God has never regretted creating us, and God never will. God never has sought to destroy God's own creation, and God never will. Such concepts and ideas are born in a very distorted and isogenic reading of the Bible. And they find home. They find home in a theology that is just not good Christian theology. And the world, primarily the younger generation, they need to hear this today. They're desperate for a corrected message. One that teaches about God as God is. Not some cosmic cop in the heavens seeking to punish us. Not for behavior that society doesn't approve of or deem to be appropriate. Rather, they are desperate to hear that ours is a God of love, a God of grace, a God of peace, a God of hope. Now, I think I've indicated this before. Humanity is flawed, yes. We make mistakes all the time. But while flawed, we are still fruitful. While broken, we are still blessed. And the world needs that message today. The world is in desperate need of that message today. They need to hear the stories of Scripture, like Noah and the flood. But the reason Hollywood is retelling the story, because even they know, even Hollywood knows, that the message of too many churches is wrong. They know that the interpretation of this story is sometimes a little off. Think about what we're telling our children. We love telling this particular story. We write songs about animals going by truesies onto the boat. We tell them that they're saved from the rain when a dove flies off and finds an olive branch. And then there's this glorious rainbow that appears in the heavens. But eventually, eventually what happens? They grow up and they think about that story 
The message that they had been taught, and they sat and they shake their heads and they walk away. Oh, they're kind about it. They're respectful. They don't want to come right and ask why on earth God would make people that God would eventually kill because he was ticked off. They don't want to say that if grace is so amazing, then why doesn't God apply it here? Not to mention the fact that their common sense tells them that all of the species of the animal kingdom cannot fit on a boat. They know it's a story. And any study than that, they know that it's a story that's been told for generations long before it was part of Judaism or Christianity. They know there's a message there. But what they heard in far too many churches, it just doesn't click. It doesn't jive with what the spirit inside of them is saying. So church, in the words of the Power Rangers, it's morphing time. It's time to change. And one of the places to start is with this picture of God that we are painting for the world. So let me say what I've been saying for 11 months. God is not angry. God loves us. Original blessing trumps original sin at every corner. And scripture, this beloved book, is full of stories that always needs to be read and interpreted and understood by the test of God's love. And one more thing, and then I'll sit down. And this is important. I know many of you have been living this for a long time. From everything I've discerned about Mount Vernon, that has been a message of Mount Vernon for a long time. But we cannot just believe it. We need to boldly and loudly and passionately teach it. And we need to do it in ways that will not be drowned out by those in the body who speak a different message. By those who prefer to speak words of anger and hate and judgment. Our morphing involves rewriting stories and teachings and practices so that God becomes known as God really is. The author of beauty, the poet of peace, the painter of the very experience of love. Reaching the next generation, it's not brain surgery. It's simply about morphing our message and returning to an accurate preaching and teaching of the gospel. God is love. Grace always wins. And our future is as bright and as beautiful as a rain. God, always, may people leave this place, not with my words, but with your words.
brought into the world. Let's uh, spend some time in prayer together, bringing before one another in God joys and concerns of all that's weighing on us uh, this day. And actually, we have a whole bunch of birthdays on this week. Sue, Anthony, and Carol Grant have one today. So we want to give thanks for that. And let's see, there's a Bill, you have one this week too, right? You don't need to do it. I hate to tell you, but it's coming anyway. <laughs> Ebenezer? Ebenezer, you have one way? You have one coming up this week. And hey, you have one this week too. We want to remember all of you folks in this birthday week. What else would you like to lift up in prayer today? Okay? Uh, not all of you, but um, I have We will remember. Louise's sister has been given two weeks um, so that we will remember you and her and pray for these final breaths that she will be taking care of. Anything else? Yes. Um, happy Mother's Day. Yeah, happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. We'll give thanks for uh, I, I'm assuming you want to especially thank you. Be thankful for your mom. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we will give thanks for moms. Is that it? You completely overwhelmed this one problem? Might be 
be set free. That the naked might be clothed. That the hunger would be fed. God, hear us as we now silently bring before you those prayers that are more private. Now, God, hear us as we pray together. That prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts.